Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Corinne Weibel, Corinne Weibel from Pete Works today. Um, Pete is uh, doing some fantastic work around assistive technology in, in the US. Uh, and as Deborah will surely tell you, it's great to have some good news from the US. Deborah's here with us at the moment. Um, she may get blown away because there's a hurricane approaching. So if uh, for whatever reason you see Deborah disappear, um, please pray for her. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, so Corinne, um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, uh, Pete and the, the the stuff that you're doing and how you came to work in technology? I understand you've been working in the field for something like 15 years now. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, and my background, um, yeah, is also in diversity and inclusion. But um, yeah, so Pete is an initiative funded by the Department of Labor to make workplace technology more accessible. Um, and so we, we work with people to help them understand why uh, it's important and also to how, how to build and buy technology to make it as accessible as possible for as many people as possible. So as you might imagine, we're big proponents of universal design. And that it means that technology, uh, when it's universally designed, uh, it's flexibly able to adapt to the user's needs so that as many people as possible can use it. And of course, this plays a huge role in expanding access to people with disabilities who are looking for work, uh, because if workplaces aren't accessible, people aren't going to be successful unless they can use the tools they need to be productive. Um, yeah, so um, so we, we work with technology leaders, a lot of policy leaders. Uh, we do a lot of activities to get them in the room together um, to figure out solutions to this problem and how uh, both the tech industry and um, the government can work together to find solutions. And um, yeah, I, I, I apologize, I said Pete works, but that's because I've got my Twitter head on and that's what I, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the hashtag and, and so on, because I know sure. that you're, you're yeah. in, engaged on, on Twitter, which we all love. Um, so uh, coming from the other side of the pond, um, again, our uh, equivalent of your department also um, is involved in, in trying to uh, engage people through assistive technology. And we've had um, the Job Accommodation Network on Access mm -hmm. Chat as well. So, so, so what's the relationship between Pete and Jan, and how do the two organizations actually sort of complement each other? Do you, do you work together, or are you kind of separate? We do, absolutely. Yeah, um, Jan is wonderful. Um, and we actually have the same we have the same funder at the Department of Labor, which is the Office of Disability Employment Policy. Um, so Jan um, is a wonderful uh, resource, especially for both employees and employers. Um, and they focus on individual accommodations, like what an individual needs to be successful. Um, and that can be technology. It can also be a lot of very low tech solutions uh, like desk type. Um, but uh, we focus on universal design and uh, talking to tech providers from the beginning about how to make their products accessible out of the box. Um, you know, and we're seeing a lot of um, great improvements in this area, like generally. Um, I think a lot more like technology, you know, both uh, Windows and Macs have screen readers built into them now, like for example. So we try to, um, you know, like of make it you know, possible for this technology to just work um, as soon as people need it. You know, so for example, a worker who develops a disability, um, you know, at any time, they can just, it just turns out that the phone system works. It has accessibility features built in it. You don't need to remediate it. You don't need to find an add-on solution. Um, so, uh, like, it's important always that accessible technology be interoperable with um, the individual supports that people may need. But um, it, of course, benefits everyone if the technology, um, if mainstream technology, just works for as many people as possible. That it is inclusive by design. Yeah, absolutely. So, essentially, um, Pete is doing strategy, and and Jan is doing tactics. 
uh, if I if I've got my kind of uh, head head on right, because you're you're doing the long term well, piece for for the larger. Right. Um, uh, whereas Jan um, is giving um, you know resources and support for individuals, uh, yeah, especially absolutely. when technology isn't accessible and they need to yeah. find a solution for that person. Yeah. Yeah. And and knowing from my own experience of working in large enterprises and with large, uh, and other big businesses, there's a mixture of both. We try to push towards the universal design end of things. We want to plan mm -hmm. to be accessible. But the reality is that with legacy IT and all of the stuff that companies and organizations have through their history, there's always going to be hacks and workarounds and, and having to put in place it's, individual solutions as well. It's true. Uh, you know, one of my favorite analogies for this is, so you picture a building. Um, a person in a wheelchair um, is always going to need their wheelchair to get around, and that's an accommodation. But the building has to be accessible, right? And it has to have doorways that are wide enough in order for that person to be able to enter the building. So okay. that's the universal design piece and the accessible technology piece. Okay, great. Uh, I know Deborah's got some, some questions, so I'll hand over. <laughs> Deborah, you're on mute. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I turned that off. I guess I forgot. Sorry. Um, the, we'll blame the hurricane, Deborah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll blame the hurricane <laughs> for everything today. Um, the I, of course, really understand the difference between, you know, Jan and Pete, but mm -hmm. I do have questions about Pete. So um, I know that Pete is putting on, you know, some really good webinars and really, uh, and I have done a webinar for y'all and as some other leaders um, around the mm -hmm. country. But how, t t ex I, um, are you consultants? So if a corporation wants to make their websites accessible, do they come to Pete or you informational? How, how would a um, how would a company in the United States work with y'all, especially with all the lawsuits that we have and the recent? Uh, we had senators actually file some paper some um, paperwork to the Department of Justice, justice asking them um, if they would really. Um, you know, let us know what their opinion is about businesses being accessible. Because we haven't, the Department of Justice hasn't really done that. I keep putting it off. And now we have several uh, of our senators, including Senator Grassley, I remember he's doing one of them, asking them to make um, an interpretation for businesses about whether or not um, websites should be accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So things are still unfolding in our country, but that, explain how, um, somebody would work with you in the United States, whether they be an individual or whether they be a corporation or somebody that just wants to make sure their technology is accessible. Sure, uh, absolutely. So um, he provides a lot of resources, uh, including training resources on our website at heatworks.org. We've got some great training resources, especially for employers. Um, large employers are really who um, we really want to educate about awareness of why accessible technology matters and how to implement it, which is, of course, the hard part because, um, you know, it's easy for people to get on board. Uh, they see the business sense, but then how do you do it tends to be complicated. So uh, we have a lot of really robust tools on our site. Um, one great place for getting started is our staff training resources, um, which really guide an organization through all the different steps they need to take to educate and train their employees across the organization and why accessible technology matters. Because uh, that can actually be one of the biggest issues that people confront is that they want to hire an accessibility consultant, say they hire Mary to do that, and then say they say, great, She's got that. Doesn't quite work that way because um, it's true that, like, you know, so much of it is the person building the website needs to be able to make it accessible. But it's also somebody, you know, take an HR department. You need, like, everyone to know to use the accessible technology, the accessibility checker in Microsoft Word before they consider that document finalized, you know, as a final step to, you know, you'd run the spell check and happily Microsoft has put the accessibility checker right next to it now, so that's become easier. 
But um, so there's that, there's staff training, um, which also goes through a lot of the hows and whys of, you know, business case arguments to make um, and, you know, trainings on how, uh, like the basics of digital accessibility, that sort of thing. Uh, we also have our tech check tool, which is a great benchmarking tool that organizations can use to see how they're doing in this area and recommendations uh, to improve. Uh, we've got a buy IT procurement guide, because uh, procurement um, and that's, that's purchasing the technology. It's so important to work with a vendor before you sign a contract to ensure that they are, they have tested for accessibility, they know what accessibility is, and they're committed to fixing accessibility issues if it turns out there are problems down the line. So, um, and we also have a tool called Policy Matters, because um, like you, Deborah, like a lot of our audience is really interested in questions related to policies, federal regulations, and other work in this space related to standards and regulations. And uh, one tool we have that uh, people have been very interested in is actually, um, we did an analysis of uh, Department of Justice settlements related to digital accessibility, because even though uh, that is not part of the ADA, the ADA was written in 1990 before anyone <laughs> was really thinking too much about digital spaces, um, but um, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, we looked at hundreds of cases. Uh, Department of Justice does consider um, digital accessibility to be part of the ADA. So, um, like, we definitely recommend that you um, take a look at our policy analysis there. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of individuals, we always, like, we are a grassroots initiative. Uh, everything we do, we try to do directly in response to people um, interested in working with us on our, our work, um, and that's online. Uh, people can participate um, in a lot of our webinars, our Twitter chats, um, you know, in-person presentations. We've gotten a lot of great feedback about what, what kind of tools and resources people need. And uh, we also have a lot of high-level stakeholders. We have an advisory board, um, a lot of Fortune 500 companies, a lot of the leading tech companies, and also disability advocacy groups, um, government institutions, all working to discuss ways that people can work together outside of their normally siloed spheres um, on this, you know, because this issue, everybody really agrees that it's important and that um, it's a win-win for everybody when we make progress on it. Right, I agree. I know that Antonio has a question, but I'll just say that the, the one, there's so many ways that Pete Works can help um, employers or corporations that are trying to become accessible. And unfortunately, right now in the United States with all our lawsuits and everything that's going on, it is really buyer beware. And I'll say this, Antonio, then turn it over to you. But I know one company was being sued by um, an attorney and they came to me and they said, Deborah, we spent a substantial amount of money with an accessibility vendor and yet we're still being sued will you help us and i just that sort of makes me sick hearing stories like that because these corporations are actually really trying to design accessible and considering universal design and still getting in trouble because they're picking the wrong vendor so uh, that's another reason why pete it's good for pete to be there so that we can take a look and see what is our government I'm sorry, Deborah. You've frozen on my end. Yes, I see. Yeah, I think I think we <laughs> lost Deborah for. I think we no. lost Deborah. So I'll go. I'll move on. So um, just okay. um, last um, there was a big conference in Vegas uh, about HR tech quite recently. Mm -hmm. So all you know, everyone in you know, uh, enterprises, um, recruitment agencies. No, basically everyone with an interest in HR. And technology was there from a marketing perspective, from technology, different areas. Uh, unfortunately, we don't. Uh, during the panels, there was nothing dedicated to accessibility. We see some conversations about diversity, but you no, know, we are talking about gender. You no, know, women, including women in the boards and all that. But when you dive deep into diversity, we, uh, there was not really a, a serious conversation about how can we support employment for people with disabilities, how can we make sure that our recruitment process is accessible, and how can we help our employees to advance in their careers? You know, if 
or if we hire them and then through life they acquire a disability and now they need a different type of accommodation in order to be able to um, advance in their careers like everyone else. So why do you think we still uh, miss this type of conversation at the big industry uh, uh, tech events focus on, on talent and human resources? Well, you know, I mean, I think it's a problem generally when we talk about um, diversity. Um, you know, I think it's people with disabilities are also are often missing in that conversation. And um, that's one of the reasons Pete does what it does and why we're always trying to build awareness. Um, awareness of accessible technology is the number one barrier that we've identified uh, in our research. Uh, we, we've done research surveys on that. We've done that through you know, interviews with people. And I, I think it is, uh, it, it is our biggest barrier, you know, just building awareness that one in five Americans does have a disability and it's one billion people worldwide there. I think, uh, you know, the Center for Talent Innovation had a study last year in 2017 that 30% of white collar workers have a disability. So this is, um, this is a huge segment of the population of employees of market share and I think um, you know it's it's really a, a tricky situation and that's why Pete is always working to start these conversations especially as high up as we can with um, you know pe people at the top of, of their companies to make them realize that um, you know if, if they think about it like uh, quite, this affects quite a lot of people, and uh, especially like even outside of you know the large number of people with disabilities themselves, um, making technology accessible tends to benefit everybody. A good example of this is text messaging, uh, designed for people that are deaf or hard of hearing. But it turns out that everybody uh, you know, finds it really useful, like a very productive, efficient way to communicate and. Uh, the list goes on and on. I mean, I could name, you know, speech tech technologies, um, closed captioning. Um, when we introduce these things into our technology, it makes it better for everybody. And I think the same is true, you know, when workplaces are more diverse, um, everybody benefits. I, I think uh, there is some growing awareness of that, but uh, it's it's a hard it's it's a hard conversation to start in a lot of ways. So I, I wish I had a better answer. No, uh, what, what I found is, you know, we're talking about uh, events where organizations invest a lot of money, a lot of time. Sometimes they send mm -hmm. their senior executives to attend the event. And some, some of them are already doing a great job on accessibility. But what I mm -hmm. see is when they are at those events, they don't bring this question on, okay? So that's that's sometimes what I feel a little bit more disappointing as you follow the event and nobody actually is able to bring this conversation at any level. But pro, well, uh, let's move on from this. So I, I had another yeah. question. I have another question that is focusing on what you just said about technology. We're talking about SMS, about how it ends up being used by everyone. Mm -hmm. So today we have so many technology coming to the market every day, right? Some of that technology was not Designed it for accessibility, but you no know, adapted and used in the correct way. People with disabilities can actually use it, even if sometimes is not branded as technology in in accessible technology. What type of testing you do in, within your team? You know, uh, what do you have a lab? How do you try to make sure, guarantee that the people that you work with, uh, even your own technologies in, in your organization, are looking at uh, ways to make sure that people who need the, the tools actually have them in the way that they can end up able to use technology like every everybody else, not as, oh, you need to use accessible tech. Well, but you can also use this technology because it's also accessible even, even if it's not branded as accessibility technology. Um, yeah, I might, I might have misunderstood the question halfway through. Are you talking about individuals using technology or no, no, companies? About how your own team it? is looking at technologies. You no, know, when you have to provide this technology to others, and how you are you looking to what is out there in the market and try to find it a way to bring it to be uh, used by people. Um, so Pete doesn't provide direct technical assistance. Um, you know, we um, 
that, that generally involves an accessibility consultant. Um, so, um, you know, we, we generally recommend we refer people to those. Um, we also refer people to um, the, the web accessibility content guidelines, uh, the WCAG guidelines, um, which are the global standard for accessibility. And, um, you know, we, we do provide a lot of resources on our site trying to, um, you know, direct people to databases where they can look up vendors that are skilled in accessibility and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's, <laughs> I wish there was kind of a better um, instant solution. But one issue with accessibility is that it is always changing so much because technology advances so rapidly, you know, new operating systems, updates. Like you can have a platform that's completely accessible, and then a new update suddenly means that it's not working with uh, the screen reader somebody uses. Uh, that happens all the time, and it's very aggravating for <laughs> both um, the vendors and the purchasers mm -hmm. and the end users. Yeah. Absolutely. At the same time, we have technology like Amazon Alexa that can be very helpful for some people, you know, and can do some very interesting things. Even it was not designed. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, I think, that I think was... Alexa is a great example of how innovation is coming up with, um, you know, just amazing possibilities for how we think and use technology. And it really demonstrates that technology can be this huge equalizer, um, you know, that like, because really, um, you know, there's no reason it can't be accessible for everyone, but it can open up so many possibilities, uh, especially when it is accessible. I, I think that was, um, you know, one of the things that Antonio was trying to get across in his question was about the, the, the sort of market scanning and looking at mainstream technologies and seeing how these uh, new technologies that are aimed at the mainstream can also uh, foster inclusion. So. Um, I'm not sure if Pete's doing much of that as, uh, strategically or whether that's just something that you all do out of interest. I certainly um, joke about the fact that working in assistive technology gives me the excuse to buy all of the best toys. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, you know, we're always interested in that space. I think, um, you know, for us, it, it does just all go back down to is this universally designed? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, one uh, future, you know, technology, emergence technology that's already here that I think demonstrates this well is autonomous vehicles, uh, which are transformative for so many people. I mean, for someone who's blind, um, that opens up so many possibilities in terms of mobility and access, and that's so key, it's one of the biggest barriers to access actually from an employment perspective. But there's there's the question of um, are they being universally designed? Like is is it going to, is it designed in a way that someone with a wheelchair can use it? Like are are the laws and policies behind this going to allow the vehicle be, to be operated by somebody um, with a disability? Uh, and I think those are really important questions and really, you know, like that we do make sure that as technology is designed, it is designed as inclusively and accessibly as possible so that nobody gets left behind. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going uh, to, I know that Hurricane Florence is taking me in and out, so hopefully y'all can hear me, <laughs> but I, I know that uh, the CDC just released a report that said one in four American adults identify as having a disability, which is staggering numbers, much higher than mm -hmm. what we're, we've heard from the World Health Organization or the numbers we're hearing from the United Nations. Of course, the United States has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, so our definition of disabilities in the Americans with Disability Act is a little different from the CRPD, unfortunately. But still, it shows the real numbers, I think, which is important. But I think that you know, where I see the greatest struggles with corporations trying to to uh, create accessible products and services is just the sheer volume 
of what has to be accomplished. The websites, I, you know, we, we were, I work with um, a lot of corporations to help them make their products and um, websites accessible. Mm -hmm. And the, just the sheer volumes of the number of people that are adding data and objects and, um, you know, they're, they're purchasing new companies and putting them in. It's the sheer volumes of it. If you take accessibility out and you say, well, really, what you need to do is just make sure anything you're providing visually, you're providing a text alternative to it. You need to make mm -hmm. sure, you know, you start... Don't, you, you know, you start quoting what they need to do, and it is actually the volume of what they have to do, which is so difficult for them. And getting accessible one time is possible, but it's maintaining and keeping it accessible. And, um, you know, I, I, you look at somebody like Atos, which is also uh, a multi-billion dollar brand um, and has 26,000 employees uh, in the United States, for example. And they're, tr you know, you just look at the volume of what they're adding to their websites and their, their services and their products, and it's overwhelming. Often it's overwhelming, which is why I think creating the framework of accessibility and blending it into the DNA of the organization is critical. But um, there's just a lot of moving parts. And uh, I, I, I feel bad for the corporations that are actually really trying in the United States, but still getting sued and their brands getting dragged through, you know, the mud. It, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but we, um, we do things a little differently in the United States. Very proud to be an American. And uh, I, I, I actually, um, I dr address this in inclusion branding, but I, I tr I'm trying to encourage the corporations around the world to think about, like you're saying, Corinne, as you are making things accessible, it improves it for everyone. As the mm -hmm. 72 million American baby boomers that are now over the age of 54, um, and their baby boomers are all over the world, but just looking from ours... Yep. The, our stats, you know, the, the, we're acquiring disabilities that impact our ability to use these computers and these devices. And so um, as you you're know, making things that's... accessible, yeah, yeah. It, it, it helps that population too. Go ahead, Corinne. I think that's so important to remember. Um, you know, we're all going to develop disabilities as we age. That's inevitable, and people forget that. And people also forget about temporary disabilities. You know, like what yes. happens and if situational uh, you your hand and you suddenly can't type? Um, you know, right. like right. I think an employer, ha you know, when you start to think about like, oh, you know, instead of having an employee out on two out for two months, if they have speech dictation software built into their computer and phone, they're going to be able to keep working with no loss to productivity. And yeah, I mean, I think, and you see this with everything. Uh, I know I use closed captions all the time now, you know, um, whether for business or pleasure. I think, uh, you know, captioning, uh, getting captioned reports after meeting is so useful. Then I have notes after the meeting that somebody else compiled for me. That adds so much to my productivity and efficiency. And I think, uh, you know, we there's so much evidence that people all learn and do things in different ways, and also that innovation is always on the edge and is based on our unique viewpoints and life experiences. And I think uh, accessibility is such an important part of that, to sparking that innovation, to making sure that all you know all of your workers are able to do their jobs, able to be productive, and that you're able to include a really diverse workforce, um, which I think there is more and more evidence that that brings so much value and benefits uh, to everybody. Yeah, um, that's what we're seeing. And we're yeah. also seeing that uh, there was a, uh, a little Twitter uh, debate uh, the other day and so, because somebody had uh, quoted uh, one of the um, stats that I had quoted in my book. And um, they were saying uh, if, things are, if your website's not accessible, 20% of the population are being left out. And as mm -hmm. we know, just because you have a disability doesn't mean you're going to have accessibility issues. In the same um, vein, just because mm -hmm. you, you don't have a disability doesn't mean you're not going to have accessibility issues for some of the reasons you mentioned, including you know, the digital divide and the language barriers. And I just joined the conversation and said, bottom line, when you make something accessible, it improves the experience for everybody. 
So right. I, I mean, mean I think so many people don't think about themselves as having a disability. You know, um, like a lot of people that are aging, like don't think about the fact that they they've got yeah that they have um, you know a visual disability. They just say, well, I just I I need to read larger types, so I need you know devices that can increase the text automatically. And so, you know, a lot of it is cultural shifts. A lot of it is changing how we think about what these things are and why they're important and why everybody needs them, you know, because like, yeah, as we're saying, like something like um, being able to use speech to text, um, that could be someone without the use of their hands. It could also be a parent carrying a kid and some groceries that also needs to use their phone at the same time. Uh, it's so many things and in so many different ways. Well, but you know, uh, uh, last week uh, when we were talking with our guest, uh, she was telling us that she, when she was presenting her app that is about to help people with uh, uh, learning disabilities to a group of VCs, uh, she was talking about the numbers of people with disabilities and the people that need, and the VC said, no, uh, I'm sure you are lying. Mm -hmm. So people who have the responsibility of you know, investing are not doing their research and then accusing someone that put, uh, uh, their life and effort of lying when she's g giving the, the numbers of the people who actually need the technology. Yeah, again, you know, I, I think it really does all circle around to awareness. And that's one reason um, in the last year, Pete has actually built a partnership with Peak to Access, which is a really exciting initiative coming out of Silicon Valley. Um, it was founded by the accessibility leaders at Facebook and Oath, which is formerly Yahoo. And they have worked out partnerships with a number of the other top tech companies and uh, a lot of higher education um, institutions nationwide here in the U.S. And they're specifically working to infuse uh, college curricula with accessibility skills to ensure that the next generation understands what accessibility is, why it's important, and that they are going to hit the marketplace with those skills. And that they, you know, once they themselves are leaders, that they will understand that this is a priority and they will have the skills to implement them. I'm aware of, of, of teacher access and, and the work that Larry Goldberg has been doing at Oath. Um, yeah. I just wish that there wasn't a requirement that you had to turn up for meetings in the US, but it makes it hard for us to participate. <laughs> Um, I actually yeah. think that this is something that we should be doing on a global scale. So um, I agree. Mm -hmm. we need to, you know, technology flows across borders and, and therefore we need to be teaching these skills uh, everywhere that we're teaching people that are creating tech. So we're trying to do similar things in the UK through Institute of Coding and the work that we're doing with that and also through um, within Atos we're, we're, we've got accessibility apprentices and we're trying to create a national apprenticeship standard for accessibility. Us so that, too. That's... Actually, that's another big um, push that we, we've been making. Um, our 2017 think tank meeting actually identified tech apprenticeships, uh, like inclusive apprenticeships, especially for people with disabilities, as a really um, great strategic opportunity, both to expand access to employment for people with disabilities, yeah. connect them with good jobs, um, but also from an employer perspective, uh, this is a high demand industry. Um, we actually, actually following this meeting where people were telling us both that the accessible technology skills gap is so great that these companies want to make their products accessible, but so many mm -hmm. reported that they can't find the people they need to do exactly. that. Um, and their products are less accessible as a result. So uh, apprenticeships are this great opportunity to help uh, connect like a pipeline of people with disabilities that want to work. Uh, they're looking to gain a certification skill, get connected to a good job, and employers um, need people to fill these jobs, and they need to get them certified quickly in exactly the skills that they're needing. Needing So it's a really exciting win-win uh, possibility. Um, yeah. And we've been working with... Uh, an apprenticeship intermediary here called Apprenti, um, which has, uh, they have traditionally worked um, with, um, to build pipelines to build diversity in the tech industry, which historically has not been as diverse as they should be. And um, they've done exciting work. 92% of their recruits are uh, veterans, women, people with disabilities, minorities. 
So uh, we've been working with them to specifically kind of getting back to an earlier discussion, like people with disabilities aren't traditionally considered part uh, of diversity and should be. So we've been working with them to identify both how many people they are working with with disabilities and to increase that pipeline um, so that they are thinking about that in a much more focused and intentional way. Right. So I mean, we within within our own organization, disability is a core strand of our diversity policies and our initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like we need to have an offline conversation about the apprenticeships. <laughs> That'd be um, great. Yeah, but um, I, I'm just tracking back. You, you you gave that astounding figure about white collar workers. Thirty percent of mm -hmm. U.S. white collar workers identify as having a uh, disability. Where was that from again? You know, that, that might have been that might have been global. Um, the study is a 2017 Center for Talent Innovation study, and you can okay. find it on our website at uh, peteworks.org/staff-training, um, and it's in the business case um, section. Okay, wow. Well. Uh, we've got yeah. Uh, really recommend. Like we were floored by that number too, but you know, at, after a beat, you believe it, right? It that's, makes that's... so much sense. That's a, it's a huge number because one of the things that, that we've found is that a lot of people are not self-identifying. So it's really astounding that it, it, you know, it's come. And, and maybe that's something to do with the type of work as well um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the attitudes to people in, in that I type of work. I think it could also be age. Yeah. You know, yeah, so many possible. people in white collar industries are able to work much longer than traditional retirement age. True. Yeah, that's that's fair. So, um, yeah, I I think we're pretty much at the end of our our uh, um, our allotted time for the interview. It's been great talking with you. I'm sure we're going to have lots to to chat about on Twitter on on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. It's been been really great chatting with you, Corinne. Thank you so much. It's I'm been really great pleased to, be to learn here. about Pete. Yeah, thank you, Corinne. Well, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yes, and thanks. Yeah, thank you um, also to uh, Barclays. I know you said, Neil. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, and to my clear text for providing the, the <laughs> captions. Yeah, yes, we are so um, grateful for our partners. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. It's uh, It's been a real pleasure. Bye, everyone. Bye.